Hey everyone, um, I'm there, Chris, and we're going to be playing the uh, Pokemon trading card game for Game Boy Color today. Um, we're going to be uh, running through any percent glitchless using a relatively new route that's been developed over the past year and a half that uh, features the uh, Bulbasaur and Friends starting deck. Um, so, without further ado, let's get started. I'm gonna time is going to start when I hit end here in three, two, one, go. All right. So, oh. Um, so the game starts with a tutorial that we generally, when you're speedrunning the game, you're allowed to load a save state that has completed the tutorial. Um, the dual escape glitch that we use to set up a run that has skipped the tutorial. Um, whenever a player is using this glitch, they will start timing with an offset after performing it, but I thought it would be fun to show it off. Dual Escape is a relatively recently discovered glitch that um, allows any duel to be ended and then by essentially crashing the dueling part of the game. And the game just takes the result of the previous duel, which defaults to win, and applies it to this one. Um, so after skipping a bunch of dialogue, we uh, go ahead and get to the tutorial and we'll be able to clear it out. Um, so while we're doing that, um, Talking a little bit about the run, we're going to pick the Bulbasaur and Friends starting deck instead of the traditional Charmander and Friends. That'll allow us to use um, different Pokemon that the Bulbasaur and Friends deck has access to. Um, the classic haymakers of Hitmonchan and Electabuzz are the stars of the early game of this run, and their ability to do damage very quickly with a high HP um, allows the, both those Pokemon to get us some like quick KOs that allow us that will. Uh, allow us to win battles more consistently in the early game, and thus hopefully play it faster. Um, this is a very RNG-dependent game, as many trading card games are, due to the shuffling mechanics. Um, we'll do our best to work around it and to manip manipulate the RNG whenever we can. Um, but, you know, we're a little bit at the mercy of the game in terms of what it, what it deals us, and so there's a lot of uh, thinking on our feet and reacting we'll have to do. Um, I'm joined by um, Autumn Out of Habit, who will be commentating during most of the battles in the game, while I'll be talking in the overworld. Uh, that way I can focus on making quick decisions, but also, and then I still explain uh, stuff when walking around and stuff. So the dual escape glitch. Uh, we hit select to look at this overworld here. We go to star, you hit down and A, and I did not perform right. If you hit it within a four frame window, then, jeez, there we go. Took a few tries, but we got it. Uh, some, uh, you know, marathon nerves there. Um, so this glitch is not allowed in, in any percent glitchless run, as you might expect. Um, however, we are allowed to use it to set up in any percent glitchless run, which is what we're doing. Um, so from here on out, we'll be actually playing the battles as intended. A much more entertaining speedrun. All right, so time for the critical first decision of the run, which is which starting deck are we gonna use? Um, so let's go ahead and select Bulbasaur and Friends. Yep, and then here we go. We will not use any, mo almost all of the cards in this deck we'll actually not use. It's really just Hitmonchan and Electabuzz we're focusing on. We also get access to some better trainer cards such as Plus Power and Gust of Wind. Uh, but before I do any of that, I got to speed up the text and cancel the animations because we're speedrunning here. And then we'll start the game here. I run over to this guy here. Um, this guy will give us free energy as long as we have less than 10 of it in our inventory. So we edit our deck quickly to make that happen. And then for the Bulbasaur strats, we actually want a little more energy. So we make a second deck that is almost all energy cards. And this deck we'll, we'll fill in with one basic Pokemon in order to let us save it. Um, but by doing this, we can actually double dip from this guy and get another extra set of energy, which we'll use throughout the game. And we have to dismiss some story stuff. We talk to our rival. He's like, ah, there's no way you'll ever beat me. Well, I've got news for him. Uh, he's only got about an hour left. Um, then we talk to Mitch here, who uh, will send his minions around that we have to fight. All right, so we go ahead to the Fire Club to do the first battle. Um, there are eight club leaders that we have to defeat, kind of similar to gym leaders. And we'll get to them. But first, we have to delete, defeat all of the different uh, like side trainer battles that we have to do to unlock those eight club leaders. Um, different trainers will give you different booster packs when you beat them. Um, the Colosseum booster pack type is basically the one type of booster pack that has all of the good cards in it, 
Uh, so we prioritize those battles first, so we get more more good cards for a longer part of the game. Um, so let's go ahead and edit our deck. We have edited it down to just Hitmonchan, um, because this game lets you have only one basic Pokémon in your deck in order to guarantee you start with that. And now here's time for the first battle. And so as we go into battles, what Chris is going to be looking at primarily will be the setup that they get against the opponent, how many Pokemon the opponent has. The battles in this game all require between two and six prizes to be collected, uh, so you have to knock out that many Pokemon. But taking that many prizes, four is about the average, is very slow. So instead we look for something like this battle here, we've got a one-on-one. -on -one. And that will allow us to, if nothing else comes out, be able to get through this in just two turns. All right, and that battle went very, very quickly, luckily. Um, we basically reset until we get a good result. Um, and by having a one-on-one -on -one like that and taking advantage of plus power, we were able to win it in just two turns. Next is Heather, right here. One-on-one -on -one again. Nice. Just getting all of the resets before I can even say anything about the bat, or all of the good setups before I can even say words. And so here we're using a Professor Oak and Bill to draw more cards. The more cards we can get through, uh, the more chance we have of getting trainers that we need. What we're really looking for here is a plus power. That is a card that does an additional 10 damage and more damage means more fast. Indeed. And now we're going into a battle with Michael. He has the second most basic train uh, basic Pokemon cards of any of the required trainers in this. As this is a Pokemon speedrun, we of course do not want to fight any optionals. So you'll see that uh, we stayed in on a one on three, but as soon as the fourth Pokemon comes up, uh, that is where Chris makes the decision to take a reset, look for something better, getting a one on two. And really we're just looking to see what the opponent has. Uh, blink and you miss it, but you can see on the bench, nothing too threatening here. And uh, with this game, the interface is incredibly fast to play through, which makes it a very fun speed game to play through. Uh, there are no lag frames, so as soon as you press the button, the thing happens. Uh, Chris used a defender, which prevents 20 damage, which keeps from being in a bad spot against the opponent Hitmonchan, and a tight setup here, but we are through. All right, and we were able to get a Doug Trio, Professor Oak, and Plus Power in those booster packs. Blink and you miss it, but um, we were getting some really good cards. Doug Trio will be the star of the show near the end of the run, but for now it is purely the Hitman Chan show. And here's Brandon. Yeah, so we are in the Lightning Club. All of the Pokemon here are weak to fighting because Ground and Rock are also considered fighting in the TCG. Uh, we're getting a one-on-one, -on -one, which is what we're looking for. A lot of Brandon's Pokemon can be one hit. Uh, this Electabuzz has 60 hit points, so it'll take two hits. We see a Zapdos come out, and that is a reset. So there's a resistance mechanic in the trading card game, where a resisted type does 30 fewer damage. Zapdos re resists fighting as a flying type. And uh, with that, essentially Hitmonchan can get up to doing 10 damage a turn. That is not fast. Doing another reset out of a non-optimal battle, and this game is very much a slot machine. You just keep going through the resets until you get something that is worth fighting, because there are definitely times where a handful of resets will still be faster than taking a slow fight. 
And here we've got another one-on-one -on -one coming up against a Magnemite. We're going second, but that's not going to be too much of a problem here. And one hit the Magnemite. That is the battle you like to see. Yep. That took us quite a while to get there, unfortunately, but uh, we were able to make that work. Nicholas is significantly easier, luckily, so hopefully this won't take too long. And we will just go ahead and always save before we fight any trainers. Actually, even if you go into the save menu unintentionally, it is faster to save the game than to say no. You always want to save before everything because any of these battles can go very long. We've got another one-on-one -on -one here. And same battle we had against Brandon, we just got to this one much more quickly. And he had another trainer down. Yep, I'm just doing a really quick deck edit here to take some of the good trainers I've got and splash them in. Um, because I have a lot of filler cards in here I don't really need. And Jennifer is one of the harder fights. Uh, just because Jennifer has three Pokemon, two, or has four Pikachu, four Surfing, four Flying Pikachu. Flying Pikachu is the worst though, so we're trying to avoid them. Flying Pikachu is such a troll in this battle that if you look in the background, Chris actually has a Flying Pikachu pillow. If you see a Flying Pikachu in this battle, it resists fighting, and that is an instant reset. And Jennifer has three uh, each of Pikachu, Surfing Pikachu, and Flying Pikachu. We take Surfing Pikachus here. And so basically the goal is to just keep putting on energy and taking down the Pokemon, because for three energy we can do Special Punch, which does 40 damage and allows us to one-hit anything in this deck, aside from the Flying Pikachu. And we are through Jennifer. Yeah. Um, generally we only take one-on-ones for Jennifer, just because Jennifer has a lot of Pokeball and Professor Oak and other cards that can find basics, and we really want to win on turn one. But in that case, I just kind of got lucky and just kind of pushed through it. Uh, up next is Chris, who is actually a fighting club member, but has enough normal types that we just kind of use him and Chan anyway. Yeah, this is bad Chris, and so the plot line is we talk to the fighting gym leader who sent his minions throughout the game, and we have to track down and beat all three of them to challenge him. So we've got a one on two here, uh, Chris has a high number of basic Pokemon. Not the ideal fight that we're seeing uh, with a Hitmonchan here, but this is very winnable, especially with a potion to take off the uh, damage that was done. Alright, um, so yeah, that we got pretty fortunate there that Himachan didn't have time to set up. So now we're gonna go do our last fight with the only Himachan deck. We're actually gonna splash in another Pokemon to make it slightly more reliable. Uh, Amanda has the most competitive deck of the early game. It's like a legitimately a deck that could be could be used in a tournament in real life Pokemon at the time. Um, it has Scyther and Wigglytuff with opposite weaknesses and resistances, um, so we want Charmander to deal with Scyther, basically. We need to add a fire type in order to take on the first trainer in the water gym. Yeah, And against Amanda, you very often will get fights where you have the wrong Pokemon for what you're up against. Uh, this is a very good fight with a one-on-one -on -one against Poliwag. Uh, the potion is slightly annoying, that'll make it take an extra turn, and the mysterious fossil that came out does have the ability to evolve into one of the fossil Pokemon. We're hoping that doesn't happen. And uh, there goes the Poliwag. The mysterious fossil is a trainer card, it has 10 hit points, it can't attack, but it does count as a Pokemon. It's actually something we may be using in a later fight. And that battle was really fortunate the way that ended, um, that we did not only saw one real threat, um, and we got two double colorless energy in the booster pack. That is not a card we're using yet, but that is a critical card in the mid game of the battle, in mid game of the speed run, because it allows us to speed up a little bit. The game notoriously does not like to ever give me any of them. Yes. Um, so here we got uh, Electabuzz, um, who is going to be, I'll just talk at the beginning of this real quick, uh, a, similar to Hitmonchan, 70 hit points, but can actually do 40 damage on turn two if you flip heads. Um, and because of that, Electabuzz is, can one hit KO anything in the water gym from turn two on as long as you land heads. We have a couple of cards that allow us to manipulate coin flips, hopefully you'll get to see that. 
and that will um, will show those off as relevant. But Electabuzz is a huge upgrade over the default strategy for this gym in the like Charmander and Friends route, which uses uh, Pikachu, um, which only has 40 HP and can only do 30 damage on turn two. Electabuzz is one of the strongest reasons to consider using a Bulbasaur and Friends start for this speedrun. And we were able to take out Sarah pretty easily. Sarah also has the last of the Colosseum booster packs that we'll be getting in this run. So we pretty much know exactly what good cards we have from this point on in the run. And it looks like we got another Professor Oak. So we have a pretty decent, pretty reasonable, decent distribution of trainers for this run. So after we defeat Joshua, we'll be able to go through to Amy. And here we go. And Joshua has another uh, battle that can have quite a bit of variance here in what we will see. Uh, going through a number of shuffles. And one on four, that is an immediate reset there. Hope to find something better. Ideally, we're looking for a one on one or one on two. Uh, Joshua also does have a Pokemon that is able to summon more copies of itself in Krabby. We've got a one on three, which is not ideal, but it looks like this is going to be something that we've at least got a shot at. We have a Professor Oak that can let us get through some cards to find what we need. And there's the drawback of Electabuzz that if you flip Tails, the attack does 10 damage to Electabuzz. And there, uh, here is one of the mechanics, the continue dual mechanic. So on the overworld, the game calls the RNG every frame. In battle, it's only when a decision is made. And the continue dual feature here, because this is a handheld game, will take you back to... Uh, basically, it's a way that you don't lose your progress whenever you're playing just on the run when your batteries run out. So it takes you back to when the last decision that you made resolved. What we do for that is, since we know the RNG for a coin flip, if we have a bad coin flip, we will continue dual to uh, try to burn that coin flip some other way. Another way to reshuffle the RNG is to use a card that uh, shuffles through the deck. And unfortunately, uh, not able to get through that fight. Sometimes a battle in this game will just uh, go south, especially with Electabuzz doing damage to itself. And this is just showing off a bit of marathon luck here for you with another one on four. And now we've got one on two. We're going second, but Tentacle is a Pokemon we like to see. It only has 30 hit points. Ideally, we would like to find a plus power to one hit it on turn one. But we were able to paralyze. That means that the Pokemon is not able to attack or retreat against us. Energy removal comes out taking out our energy, but we do have uh, the ability to take out the tentacle. Horsey is knocked out on the next turn. That Pokemon can be a bit of a troll, as Horsey has a smokescreen attack that makes us flip a coin to see if we even get to attack. Shelter goes down, and that is the battle, and we will get to finally go up against the first gym leader of the run. We have mostly cleared out almost all of the pre-gym leader battles. There's a couple stragglers we'll catch up with along the way, um, but now we're dealing with gym leaders and we'll start with Amy starting now. Now gym leaders, uh, they cheat in this game. They are guaranteed to, in their opening hand, have at least two basic Pokemon and some energy in the hand. And within the first five cards that they draw, they will have another two basic Pokemon. All of the gym leaders are six prize battles. So one on three, not as bad as it looks because generally you're going to have to take out four Pokemon unless you can get a really quick setup. Horsey goes down quickly. Goldeen is not a threat. We have our Electabuzz set up. And we're just gonna hope to not see another basic come out. We don't get the basic, so this is going to be a three prize Amy and we take those. Yeah, this is a very fortunate result. Being able to win within the first five turns makes the gym leader battle, club master battle, sorry, um, tremendously shorter. Uh, so getting that to kind of help make up for our, our poor luck against Joshua is really nice. So we actually keep the Electabuzz deck for one more battle to battle the uh, minion before the science club leader. That's Joseph here. 
Joseph has a deck of a bunch of flying Pokemon, and then after this, we'll switch to another. I don't know about you, but science is my favorite Pokemon type. <laughs> and apparently science for Joseph means birds. And that's why we're bringing Electabuzz. We've got a one on three. Uh, that can be a sort of a 50-50 on if you want to stay in on it. We have a plus power, which if anything goes sideways, can get a little more damage output. And we're just hoping to not see more Pokemon come out. And there you'll see that Chris put the plus power on and used the first attack to avoid the chance of taking damage to themselves. And now testing the coin flip, we had a plus power there, but with Electabuzz, a lot of what we'll do is test to see if we get heads on the coin flip on something we can one hit. If we don't, then we'll go back and see if we can alter that, but getting through Joseph without too much trouble, and now we are going to have another deck edit. Yep, now we are building the uh, Kadabra deck. Oh, I'm a little short on trainers. Oh, well. Um, we have a Kadabra deck that, um, this is another change from the uh, Charmander strat. Using Kadabra instead of Mewtwo allows us to defeat the Science Gym a lot earlier, which is uh, pretty helpful for us. Um, because that makes routing a lot easier. Uh, Kadabra also has some key advantages in this fight, able to do a bit more damage, and the evolving art uh, gets rid of paralysis. And let's go. Yeah, and then what we're really looking at that Rick, the science gym leader, has basically take Cinnabar Mansion from Pokemon Red and Blue and add Porygon, so we're looking at Grimer, coughing, a lot of poison, and also Mewtwo will come out. Not sure who thought up this deck, but yeah, you know, this battle can definitely be a bit of a troll as there are a lot of status options. One reason also that we like to use Kadabra here, evolving a Pokemon will cure any status ailments that it has. Uh, Porygon resists our psychic attacks, which is a bit annoying, but Kadabra does a 50 damage attack, so it'll still do 20. We'd ideally like to have found a plus power there, but still two hits to take out the Porygon. And the AI will always want to swap in Porygon, because the AI prioritizes having resistance out and getting weaknesses away, as well as going after any of our weaknesses. Uh, there you see a good card, Gust of Wind, which lets us switch which Pokemon is out to something on the bench. So Chris using that to get a quick KO. Uh, especially because of the prize card mechanic, where you put six of your cards down at the beginning of the battle and you don't have those in your deck. It can be nice to try to get a quick KO to see if you might be able to pick up the card that will help you out here. No paralysis from the Grimer, so this is just going to be one more turn, and that is Rick. All right. That, um, yeah, I made some uh, questionable decisions in there, but I was able to save it. I was able to use the Continue Duel feature to uh, check what Professor Oak would give me. And now what I'm doing is uh, very fun. Um, they're making a second deck. This isn't exclusive to the Bulbasaur strat, but it is a new strategy uh, that's used in pretty much all levels of play now, which is where you make a second deck with Magnemite. Um, and the deck only has Magnemite and Energy. It is designed to lose on purpose. Um, we have two mandatory fights against our rival, um, where the only thing we get if we win is a, um, a promotional card we won't use. It's a six prize battle, and Ronald cheats just like gym leaders, so we really don't have time to mess with that. Um, the old way to deal with this was to just try to do nothing and hope for the best. Uh, but what we're going to do instead is use Self-Destruct, which is an attack that uh, takes two energy and will KO Magnemite in most circumstances. Uh, Ronald so is very bad at this game. Yes, Ronald is not the fastest battler, unfortunately. So Magnemite can be a little slower than a perfect Ronald loss, but is way, way more consistent. Perfect and also way cooler. A lot of fun. Uh, so from here, we actually have one more battle we'll use the Kadabra deck for, and this is the other advantage of using Kadabra in the Science Gym, is uh, there's a very odd battle in the Grass Gym. Uh, Brittany is a trainer with a deck called Etc., which literally just has 20 basic Pokémon of like four different types in it, no overlapping weaknesses, lots of them. So we need a Pokémon that can do like 50 damage to a lot of different types, and Kadabra fits the bill, so let's give it a go. Yeah, this deck basically is where the developers just put all the Pokemon that they couldn't find anywhere else to put in. Uh, 
So we actually have gotten a one-on-one, -on -one, which is not something that you see every day. And there's a second Pokemon coming on the bench. Caterpie is a bit annoying as it can paralyze us. Also, Abra is a bit frail, only having a 30 hit points. And there you'll see that Chris did not make the attack. That way uh, they have the ability to evolve and get rid of that paralysis. And a lot of times in this battle, uh, since Brittany has so many Pokemon, we do often see this go all the way to the full four prizes. And there is a lucky uh, non-paralysis there, putting on the defender that will reduce damage by 20 to us. Also picking up a clutch potion, and Diglett can't do anything without energy, so Brittany is down, and all things considered, that's a pretty quick Brittany. We take those. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that is uh, fairly fortunate. Um, so normally we would feature uh, Ponyta here. Um, it was a common Pokemon that we usually get like, I'm almost every run we have gotten Ponytas. Um, oh, oh, whoops. Um, but unfortunately in this run, it seems we got zero of them. That is almost a first. I can I count on one hand the number of times that's happened to me. So we're going to just fill in um, with uh, Magmar, who's the second best option here, and very reliable and dependable that we'll use to beat Kristen and Nikki to secure the grass gym. Uh, it's a shame, because Ponyta is, is a cool new variant that we use in the strategy because of Ponyta's ability to attack on turn 1, um, but in lieu of that, Magmar has the ability to do 30 damage on turn 2 very reliably. And that still lets us win this battle very quickly. I didn't even give Autumn time to talk this time, I guess. Um, and so, <laughs> now... Yeah, we're just it... seeing the battle starting here. Oh, <laughs> Wow, battle's so fast that uh, I beat it in the time of the tape delay. Isn't that amazing? All right. So <laughs> now it is time to go to Ishihara's house. It's kind of the equivalent of Bill in this game where Nikki is busy studying instead of being a uh, club master. So we tell Nikki, hey, we're going to challenge you. All right, cool. We're going to go back to the grass gym. We're going to challenge Nikki. Nikki has a lot of status sync Pokemon and a lot of Pokemon that uh, use call for family type moves to fill the bench. So it is a high variance gym leader battle. So we kind of just got to hope for the best here. We will see how it goes. And we will catch up. So here Nikki is finally back in her gym. And let's see what the slot machine has in store now. And we've got our Magmar. Quite a few shuffles as we've only got one in the deck. We've got a one on three. And unfortunate early paralysis, Magmar can be a bit risky. Uh, fortunately, we have a full heal, which heals any statuses. Uh, Magmar will take until second turn to be able to do anything, taking another paralysis. So what we're going to do, uh, Chris is going to use the defender to use Professor Oak, and hopefully, and we did find a full heal there, uh, their goal was basically to make sure they're not wasting that defender, so that can prevent some damage. And now that Magmar oh. is online and able to do 30 damage, which is doubled against everything, we have gotten a 3 prize Nikki, which we absolutely take those. We are kind of getting like some real interesting luck here, which is good because I made a huge mistake playing that full heal on turn one when Magmar still couldn't do anything anyway. There was no reason for me to play that, and I felt very foolish for wasting it. However, Professor Oak bailed me out. What a cool guy. We really appreciate that trainer card. Uh, so here's another uh, newish strategy, or more popular strategy. Um, Scyther was for a long time the unquestioned best Pokemon to beat this gym leader with. Um, but this time, um, we didn't get Scyther, and uh, it's kind of slow to try to get Scyther th if you uh, did not naturally pick him up through booster packs. Uh, did I still have the doubles? Yep. Um, so we use Nidoran and Nidorino instead, which are two very strong grass-type Pokémon with their own advantages over the Rock Gem. Uh, so let's get this started. Alright, yeah, and we will get the battle online here, just saving the deck. and. The Rock Gym is nice to us and doesn't make us fight against any minions. We just go in, say, hey Gene, we want to fight you. Gene says, okay. So here, not the ideal start going up against an Onyx. It has 90 health. So Nidoran has the ability to do 30 damage for when 
uh, grass energy. However, it does require a coin flip, and on a Tails, we do nothing. Going to energy search to get another uh, grass energy, and the goal is to get a grass energy and a double colorless in order to be able to attack with Nidorino on a second turn. And pulling out all the stops, we're going to try to use a card called Gambler, which does a coin flip. You shuffle your hand into your deck on a head slick we got. You get eight cards, on a tails you get one. Uh, you are able to, if you hold down a button and reset before it resolves, you can go back and scam your way into going back to before the gambler was used, if you're only going to get one card. And here, you saw Chris reset back after getting the heads in order to use the Gambler to draw eight new cards. We're looking to pick up a Nidorino here if we can, because that is much less risky. And right now we are just at the mercy of the coins until we are able to get something to draw into a Nidorino. And this is, this is one of those games where you can easily fall into a, a sunk cost type of situation where You've got some time into the battle and you've got a bit of a setup and it's just very hard to determine if you're going to be able to make it. And there we see Chris saying, no, nah, this battle's just not going to work. So we reset, we've got a one on two and hopefully this one will go better. Rhyhorn is annoying as it has an attack Leer that it, if it flips a heads, it makes it so that we cannot attack unless we switch out or evolve. And trying again, one on two. We have the Nidorino in hand. We also have a Professor Oak. If we want, we can gamble with the Professor Oak and try to hope that it will give us one of the double colorless. Uh, it looks like Chris going for the slightly more conservative strategy to just put the energy we know we have. And so going to Professor Oak before putting on the energy in hopes of finding a double colorless. So Nidorino for three can do an attack that flips two coins and does 30 for each heads. Or now that we picked up that double colorless, we have just a free 50 damage attack. Also, we like to avoid flipping coins when we can because coin flips do take a few seconds. And that actually will play into strategy into some of the later battles in that we will avoid fighting against some Pokémon that can flip a lot of coins at us. And now we are set up, and it's just time to sweep. Oh. And Jean deciding to sneak in a last Geodude there, just to be annoying and waste a little bit of our time. And it looks like we made it. Alright, yeah, that was uh, some... I made some small mistakes in that first fight, but m mostly I the biggest mistake I probably made was, you know, using the Gambler, seeing no Nidorino, and then continuing on anyway. Uh, one of the prizes we got, one of the cards we got in the booster pack was Articuno, a rare water type that we will actually take advantage of now that we drew it in the uh, near the end of the game. Uh, so look out for Articuno later. For now, we are in the middle segment, which uses Diglett, Dugtrio, and Hitmonchan to maximize our ability to get quick KOs. Um, so this will be our first appearance of Dugtrio. Um, Diglett is a pretty decent Pokémon despite low HP due to its free retreat and uh, be able to do 30 damage on turn 2, but Dugtrio is the star of the show, being able to do 40 damage turn 3 and 70 damage turn 4 with very little drawback. That 70 right. damage is so high we can attack without resistance, it's very nice. Yeah, and it looks like we have 3 Dugtrio, which is going to help us out a lot against the Elite Four or I'm sorry, the Pokemon Dome here. This game tries to be different from the rest of Pokemon games. Getting a one on two start here and just throwing out some damage with Diglett. One of the big things to worry about when you're running a Dugtrio situation is to make sure that you have a way to get to Dugtrio. If you don't have a reliable way to draw into it, Diglett only has 30 HP and that doesn't go very far. You see, we will throw on a Defender, Professor Oak, that gets us into a Dugtrio. Fortunately, with three in the deck, pretty easy to get to. Picking up a full heal, which will help if the opponent manages to get a Paralyze here with Electabuzz. And now that we've got Dugtrio with three Fighting Energy, 
That's a 40 damage attack. Now we're up to Earthquake doing 70 damage. Doubled in this gym, nothing can stand up to that. And at this point, it is just a matter of getting through. Uh, you saw that we used Slash against the Magnemite instead of Earthquake, and the reason for that is that's just one fewer button press, so just a small optimization there. Full Heal bails us out against the Magneton, which paralyzed us. And going up against the Kangaskhan, we Earthquake, and that is our, I believe, our fifth medal in the bag. And fifth metal means it's time to fight Ronald again. Um, luckily, since we made that um, self-destruct deck our second deck, we were able to keep it around all the way to our second Ronald fight, so we don't have to make the deck again. That saves us a nice 20 seconds. That's another optimization we kind of came up with, and that's one of the big reasons we took the extra energy at the beginning of the game, actually. Um, so now we just need two turns, and we will happily get to self-destruct. It'll be very fun. And boom! That's it! All right, so coming up, we, we got just flipped the coin to see who started the battle. <laughs> That's basically it, yeah. All right, so basically now, coming up after this, we got Ken and Murray. Um, they are fighting and psychic type club leaders, but they have a lot of high HP normal type Pokemon anyway. Um, for some reason, um, so we use Doug Trio for those because Doug Trio is just such a strong general purpose attacker. Him and Chan is also useful in both those battles for specific reasons. We'll get to when they come up, and here's Ken. Yep, we are just walking up, and we will say hi to Ken, another gym that lets us just walk in and challenge the gym leader without having to worry about it. Starting with Diglett and Doug Trio in hand, one on three, but not as crucial to see how many Pokemon the gym leaders have, because we know there's very likely going to be the fourth anyway. And out comes a Jigglypuff. Jigglypuff can be very annoying to go up against, as it does have the ability to summon more Jigglypuffs out of the deck, so that is something that if we see a Gust of Wind, we'll often try to pull those in to take them out quickly. And fortunately, with the Doug Trio in hand, we are able to evolve before Diglett can be KO'd. And now that we've got Doug Trio set up with four fighting energy, Unless something goes very unexpected, we should be able to just sweep through the rest of the deck here. Yet another game where uh, the fire gym leader notoriously does not use that many fire Pokemon. Alright, and that'll be that. It's actually kind of amazing how true to the game um, the fire gym is, isn't it? We do still oh. have to get through the Growlithe here first. Ah. I'm a little ahead. All right, um, so now we've defeated Ken, and now um, we have Murray to defeat. Murray is the psychic type gym leader, and we keep both Doug, Doug Trio and Hitmonchan in. Hitmonchan we keep in for a few reasons. One reason is that Hitmonchan is weak to psychic, and the AI in this game has some flaws, including um, anytime the AI sees a weakness, it will basically force its psychic type Pokemon into play, even if they're not ready. And so Hitmonchan can do a lot of damage to Pokemon that are much more threatening when they're set up than they are early. Um, and so with that, we're able to deal with the um, problems that these psychic types would bring us a little bit more easily. We're right. actually going to use Hitmonchan here for one other purpose I'm going to just get to quickly, um, which is that Mr. Mime has a really annoying Pokemon power that... Uh, oh, crap, I forgot to do. <laughs> has a really annoying Pokemon power that uh, prevents any damage beyond 20 from being done. So Hitmonchan can deal with Mr. Mine. And that's, and I'll uh, let Autumn take it from me. All right, and there, one thing that we do in these battles also, if we have Diglett and Hitmonchan both available, is we will always lead with the Diglett because it is able to retreat without paying any energy. And you saw the reset there, the reason for that was uh, Chris attacked with Diglett, which would make Mr. Mime a three hit. So they reset back to their last decision so that they could instead switch in Hitmonchan to make Doug Trio, or make Mr. Mime rather, a two hit. And the AI throwing another Mr. Mime at us. And with our Hitmonchan set up, we will take that. Throwing more energy onto the Diglett in case we need to just start swinging a little bit faster with Doug Trio.
And speaking of, Doug Trio is coming in to hopefully sweep the rest of the way. We've got an energy search, which will let us pull the fourth energy that we need. And we have a lot of other nice trainers in hand that we could use. Uh, however, we do try to avoid using trainers until they're necessary, because if it's possible to just sweep through with Doug Trio, then using trainers only spends more of our time. And here is uh, going the Kangaskhan, just one Pokemon left on the bench, but that was our last prize. And seven medals down. All right, we got one club master left to go, and that's Mitch. Um, and a uh, quick note, I switched to Doug Trio basically because there are only two Mr. Mime in that deck, so once I KO'd both of them, I knew I was in the clear, and I no longer needed to play with him and Chan. Um, so I quickly dismantled the Magnemite deck that I forgot to dismantle before, and now we're going to build a deck with just Articuno. Um, Articuno is used here, uh, instead of Mewtwo, it's kind of personal preference up to the runner. Um, and the reason I'm doing it is because um, the first uh, Elite Four battle will also use water types, so we can uh, save a deck at it this way. Um, the Articuno is a little bit slower against Mitch, but more consistent, especially if the fight goes long, because Articuno's fighting resistance prevents most attack animations. Um, and here we go, here's the battle. Alright, and let's see what this wants to give us before we get to the Pokemon Dome. And we've got a one on three. We will pretty much always with Articuno see the fourth Pokemon. So it's just a matter of setting up early while Mitch is unable to do anything against us. And going through some cards in hopes of having a plus power available or a Gust of Wind to deal with a problematic other Pokemon. Machop gets a Defender, but that is no match for our Blizzard attack, which does 50 damage. Primeape we do not like to see, because it can do some damage and get through pretty quickly. But we have a Potion to heal that up for safety. And unfortunately, that will take two hits to go through. And Blizzard has a cool effect that unfortunately we're not getting luck with the coin flips here, but if we flip heads, it will do 10 damage to everything on Mitch's bench, which in some cases can either take out some of those Mankeys, or at least reduce a hit that we need to do to one of the Pokemon. But... The game finally realized that we are, in fact, doing this at a marathon and is giving the appropriate luck for it. And there we go, doing the 10 damage. If we could have gotten one more Blizzard off, that Mankey could have been down before we ever got to it. The game throws a Hitmonlee at us, thinking it bought some more time, but with that plus power, Chris is able to take out the final Pokemon, and that is all eight medals in our back. All right, and now it's time for the Pokemon Dome, where we'll deal with the uh, Elite Four, I'm sorry, Grand Masters, I don't know why they changed the names, uh, in order to try to collect the legendary Pokemon cards and win the game. Um, each of the four Grand Masters has one of the four, le three legendary birds, and also Dragonite for some reason, um, in their deck that it's built around. Courtney has Moltres and the Fire and a Sapphire type deck that I'm going to start with now. And uh, one thing to note, while we, you would think that we're using water against the Moltres deck because Moltres fire type weak to water. Unfortunately, we're not getting that in this game. The legendary birds do not have weaknesses. All they have is a resistance to fighting. Although we're going to be for the rest of the way after this using fighting types anyway. But Articuno is able to do double damage to pretty much everything else in the deck here. Uh, the main thing that we are worried about against Courtney is if we see a Ninetales come out. Because Ninetales has an attack that can do eight coin flips, and that's just a way, you know, might as well sit down, make yourself a sandwich, maybe make a phone call. So we like to prioritize getting rid of Vulpix before it can evolve. Now Moltres needs three energy before it can do anything to us. 
So a lot of times we like to use energy removal or there using Professor Oak to get the second plus power. That way we can do all 70 damage to take out that Moltres in one shot. Uh, Growlithe also is a Pokemon that we want to try to get rid of because if Arcanine comes out, that is the problem is it has an attack that does 80 damage to us and for those of you who don't want to do counting, we have 70 hit points, so that's a problem. All in all, that was a very quick Courtney. Yeah, we're pretty fortunate there. Um, Articuno does, is a pretty reliable Pokemon, but we were lucky that we only got one Moltres to fight, and we were able to one-hit KO the Moltres, so not even really a big obstacle. Uh, so now for the rest of the game, we'll be using Dugtrio. Dugtrio is particularly good against Steve because of all the other lightning Pokemon. Um, but basically, that Earthquake attack does so much damage that it still three hit KOs Legendary Birds or two hits with plus power, and that's going to be good enough for us. So we're going to go ahead and rock the trio. Here we go. And we are saving. Always save before every battle in this game. It will cost you if you don't. We've got Diglett, we've got Doug Trio in hand. A one on four, which means that Steve probably does not have his legendary Zapdos in hand. Uh, all of the promo legendary birds that were made for this game have a Pokemon power that comes out whenever they go into play. So especially if you get a one-on-one -on -one against something, uh, that is always a sign to be wary in this game because that means that there's probably a Pokemon in hand that is going to cause some problems. The legendary Zapdos can come into play and do, I believe it's 70 damage randomly? Uh, it's 30. Okay, I'm mixing up effects on that. Fortunately, I do not get hit with it that much. Getting rid of the non-promo Zapdos, uh, we have a Jolteon, which is a rare treat here. Nice. And we have our And it looks like the game likes us, getting through only five prizes against Steve. We like to see that. And a lot of turns where Steve just wasn't able to do anything because he didn't have enough energy. And now we have Jack. Jack is awful. We have in the Discord a channel called I Lost the Run To. And I'd say about half the time I see, it's Jack that kills the run. So Jack uses an Articuno-based deck, which will also give us a bunch of water types. We've got a one on four here. And using the energy removal, because Lapras' attack will do 10 damage, but it'll also do a bonus 10 if it has multiple energy equipped. And that would be enough to take out our Diglett. Battle is getting a little bit dicey here, evolving to Doug Trio for safety. But now that we are set up here, using a potion to get down to only 10 damage, because this battle can go south pretty quickly if you've got some damage stacked up on Doug Trio. But now we have Earthquake set up, or as it is sometimes known, the Wind Button. Looking, using a gust of wind there to see if there's anything that we want to take out before it could become a problem. Uh, nothing was more appealing, so Chris will be keeping that gust of wind in their back pocket, just in case they need that later in the battle. And Lapras getting a confusion effect that makes us need to do a coin flip when we attack or else we damage ourselves. Fortunately, we had a full heal and a plus power available to get rid of the Lapras in one turn. And let's see if there is any way to speed up this Lapras. And we have the Gust of Wind, so we decide, you know what, we can take out Seal in one turn. So we will get rid of that now, and that's one more turn to hopefully find a plus power to deal with the Lapras. Woo! Oh! Alright, um, so, uh, this is a really good dome so far. Um, I've had about two minutes on average for each fight. Um, this is really the kind of run you're hoping for. I don't want to jinx it by saying that, but woo! Alright, here's Rod. 
Yep, and Rod has just started talking to you now. And Rod uses everyone's favorite legendary bird, Dragonite, although in practice you pretty much never see it as it is not a basic and has to be evolved up to. And to be honest, in the trading card game, uh, Dragonair is more of a threat. Uh, but what you're really looking for here, Rod has also quite a few uh, Cowerless, um, a few Cowerless Pokemon as well as some fire types in his deck. And the only energy type I believe is going to be fire in here. Or no, I'm mixing up the battles, sorry about that. Magikarp comes out, and as in real life, Magikarp is very frail, not much of a threat. And we have Doug Trio set up, so fingers crossed, hopefully this battle should be just about done. Ooh, all right. Rod was not too much of a problem. Despite Rod being the leader of the Elite Four, he's probably the easiest fight we had. However, we got one more fight. Oop, it's Ronald, and we are not allowed to just intentionally lose this one. We need to beat Ronald to win the game. Ronald's got one of each of the legendary birds in a fire-type based deck that can be easy, but is often a huge pain, so we gotta hope for the best. Let's see what happens. And as we had talked about earlier in the run, Ronald has all of the ones that have on-play Pokemon power abilities, so... I will definitely, he will definitely be trying to play down cards to get various effects against us. And uh, we use the energy removal on Dratini there. And the reasoning behind that is Ronald does have some double colorless in the deck and that can make Dratini evolving into Dragonair become a very quick threat. And a lot of this game is also just mitigating outcomes before they can give us a bad time. And then getting rid of all of the cards in our hand to be ready to use Professor Oak without wasting anything. And Professor Oak will up, or we will top deck a Pokeball, which allows us to search for a Doug Trio. Now Professor Oak will get us some energy and Doug Trio is able to one hit through Dratini. Oh my god. And we are on the third of the Dratinis now. Woohoo! And Kangaskhan coming in. If no other basics come out, this is going to be a very quick Ronald. Well, I got a spoiler alert for you. That's it. That was a fantastically lucky Ronald. We didn't see a single legendary bird, so we were able to use energy removals and breeze through that thing. So all we got to do now is just collect the legendary Pokemon cards and mash the buttons for about... You know, about 30 more seconds, and that'll be the end of the run. This was actually a really lucky run, all things considered. Uh, lots of good uh, RNG here, and uh, I made at least a couple good decisions, so... I'm not too unhappy about that, and this will be time. Alright. I actually do not know what time I got, because my, uh, my timer was a little broken, um, but I hope it was good. <laughs> it was a very good time indeed. All right, that's that's really good to hear. Yeah, it looks like I came in a little underestimate, which is not amazing for the schedule, folks, but happy for me. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I really enjoyed running this game. Um, I hope I'm glad everybody got the chance to see this uh, Bulbasaur and Friends strategy. Um, I know this the uh, trading card game speedrun glitch list has changed a lot in the last couple of years. I'd, you know, happily encourage anybody who has tried it before to give this Bulbasaur strategy a try, see if it makes the game more fun or interesting, you never know. Um, yeah. 